I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, Thank good you. and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to The Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm your co-host, Matt Bertico. And I'm your other co-host, Dean Detloff. Dean, you're away at camp. You gotta give us a report back. You gotta <laughs> tell us what you did. You gotta tell us who was the best at Buck Buck, uh, who played the best pranks on the girls' cabin. Yeah. Yeah, tell us all of it. Just lay sure. it all out here. All right. I was gonna save this for the walk-in. It feels like walk-in talk, but I can... Uh, I'll save the juicy stuff for the walk-in, obviously. So Yeah, yep, please, I, please. I was away at summer camp, an extremely weird thing that I did get paid to do this summer for my extremely weird job <laughs> doing Catholic solidarity work. Um, we were at the summer camp, and it was a lot of fun. There, it was all there. Everything you can imagine was there. There was canoeing. There was a huge tray of uh, macaroni and cheese that you <laughs> should not have eaten before you canoed. Um, there was, uh, yeah, all kinds of wild games going on. Uh, a great time. No buck buck this time around. I feel like I need to sort of, you know, ingratiate myself to the uh, to the other adults first before I suggest such a risky behavior. But, yeah, that um, makes sense. It was great. So my job was to do social justice programming in this camp. And it was probably, I imagine, the weirdest summer camp uh, for a high schooler to go through. Um, you know, on the one hand, they're like learning leadership skills. They're learning how to um, bait a hook and catch a fish and do all of it. And then also they are learning about why extractives are very bad in Latin America. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was awesome. We We did the biggest success was... Uh, so there's a book by the Boff brothers, Leonardo and Clodovis, called Introducing Liberation Theology, and my friend Keegan, who was on the show a long time ago and works with me, he remembered this passage in there where in a base community in Brazil, they made this great big dragon uh, based on Revelation, and then they used the dragon with all these seven heads as an object lesson for people to like describe the forces of oppression in the world and we did it with the teens. And I got to tell you, the teens are all right. They know what's out there. They know what's oppressing them. And they are ready to slay these dang dragons. It was great. What a great week of camp. That sounds great. Well, good for the teens. Good for you. Bad for the dragons. I'll say I'll say this this much more, though. It's extremely weird having been a person who go who went to a an evangelical summer camp at formative times of my life where at Christian camp, you know, you do the same stuff. You do the kayaking, you're doing the, uh, I don't know, all the wild tug-of-war games and so on. And then two times a day, they do pull you into a big tent, and they ask you to sing a bunch of Hillsong songs, and at the end they turn off all the lights or candles or whatever is going on, and they ask you to give your life to Jesus. Uh, Catholic summer camp rules because we didn't do any of that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was awesome. <laughs> Being Catholic at Catholic summer camp means listening to a bunch of weirdos explain to you, like, why uh, the preferential option for the poor is technically part of Catholic social teaching. Like, what a weird situation, and I'm here for it. It rules. It sounds great. It sounds like it doesn't get any better than that. Um, as a uh, as a former goer of evangelical church camp, uh, it, the, the whole idea, when you, when you said it to me the first time, it sounded horrific to me. Um, <laughs> but this sounds good. This one sounds all right. I think it's fine. I still don't like the idea of camp in general. Like, uh, I'm very much an inside person. I don't want to be outside. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, if you have to do it, I guess this, this is the way. It was great. There was, uh, it, there were all city kids who went. And, you know, I grew up in a rural community. I was really getting back to my roots for sure, checking out what's going on outside. And we were canoeing around. And one girl in my canoe said that she had never seen a dragonfly in real life. And the other girl... <laughs> 
said uh, she didn't know that lily pads were real. So it was a real kind of like, whoa, this is the world, you guys. <laughs> you got to check it out. <laughs> lily pads, they aren't real. Claude Monet, he made them up in his great painting, The Water Rules. Um, <laughs> That's right. Well, good. Good for them. I'm glad everyone learned something. Uh, well, get ready. Hold on to your butts, because this week on the Magnificast, you're going to learn something, too, whether you like it or not. I mean, maybe you already know this. It's basically camp. <laughs> it's basically camp. Uh, our podcast is basically camp for your ears. So this week we decided to jump back into one of Jesus's parables. Everyone likes these episodes, or at least people tell us they like them. Uh, this could be all a cruel prank. Not unlike camp. <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> this right. time, though, we're going to talk about Luke 16, 19. That's right. The rich man, Lazarus. This is everyone's favorite parable. Or maybe not, but this is the one that mm -hmm. uh, people always talk about. At least uh, whenever I bring up parables in my everyday life, this is the one that people talk about. I don't know why. It's like a, it's a good one, though, for sure. Uh, it's a classic. So if you grew up in church, this is probably one that you already know about. And if you didn't, don't worry. It's going to be okay. We're going to read the parable in just a <laughs> minute. But basically, it's a story about like the inversion of social class. You know, there's a, a poor guy and there's a rich guy, and they both have their sort of respective lives. And then they both die, spoiler alert, <laughs> and one of them goes to heaven, one of them goes to hell, and uh, they switch spots. The rich guy goes to hell, and the poor guy goes to heaven. Uh, it's a great story. It's, uh, it's probably the only time, I think, ever in the Gospels that Jesus actually does tell you who goes to hell. Um, and I love that. That's fun. Um, but, I don't know, there's all kinds of ways to misread this and get it wrong, so why not get it right? Um... Christians on the right specifically love to read the Gospels as being like, you know, mostly apolitical or at least, uh, you know, more importantly about one's individual salvation. But in this parable, we've got Jesus telling a story about someone going to hell or, you know, something like hell. It's it's complicated. <laughs> we'll talk about it in a minute. And that guy is rich. And you can't really read around that meaning because it's explicitly in the text. <laughs> but I don't know. People, Christians on the right, they don't care about the Bible anyways. Um, but overall, in all of this, what we get is a story that rebukes the wealthy for mistreating the poor. And the further we get into it, I think the more interesting and like the more damning it all gets, for sure. It gets... Oh, pun intended. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so anyways, to get to the bottom of this parable, we're going to turn back to our two main authoritative commentaries on the Bible. That's right. William Herzog's Parables as Subversive Speech and also uh, Ernesto Cardinal's The Gospel and Solon Taname. Um, those are our two guideposts. Don't go to church without yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Dean, do you want to uh, do you want to do the reading for this week? Sure. Yeah, I could be the lector. Yeah, Absolutely. I'm, I've got a big, um, uh, a big thing, uh, a big thoroughfare of incense over here. I'm just going to swing it around while you read. That'd be great. And I'll uh, duck when it sort of comes by so it doesn't clip me. Um, so this is from Luke 16, verse 19, for those following along at home uh, with your gospel and Salentanami in the church pew in front of you. Uh, it goes like this. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. <laughs> Bummer. Uh, in Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, Even if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. The end. And scene. <laughs> Thank you. The word of the Lord. Um, okay. So what we get here is a, it's a great parable. 
Uh, it's full of all kinds of stuff. You know, um, in a lot of the other parables that we've read so far, it's always like, you know, there's a vineyard, there's a king, whatever. There's a, <laughs> there, uh, there's a court, all these things. But But now we're getting to the real good stuff, right? The real dramatic stuff. There's a rich man, there's a poor man, and then they die. And uh, there's this great scene between uh, heaven and hell in the afterlife. And, oh, my God, if there's anything that evangelicals love, it's it's missing the point of the story and doing the weird uh, calculus of, like, how the afterlife works based on uh, <laughs> based on this particular reading. That you'll be able to see people in hell when you're in heaven. And would that really be heaven if you could see people in hell? Dang, is what evangelicals say every time. <laughs> They do have a resounding dang because they can't say damn. No, they can't. Um, yeah, it's true. I mean, we can talk in a minute about how to kind of deepen this parable a little bit. But I think the two things that are most interesting me, to me are that this parable, you know, we've done a lot of other parables on the show and talked through Herzog's way of complicating them. Uh, what's fascinating about this one is that there's not a lot of subtext to it, <laughs> right? It's all pretty straightforward. Um, I think that is very interesting. But nevertheless, evangelicals do like to overcomplicate it, primarily because they, I think, are kind of invested in class interests, right? Like, for example, uh, in the parable, I think on a straightforward reading, and as we'll see when we get to the Gospel in Salentaname, who are, is comprised of people reading it from a different social class, um, you know, you can kind of tell what the class dimensions are here. The the wealth is what's going to get you in hell and so on. Um, but in the evangelical sense of reading it, uh, there's this way of really like creating a whole moral mythos around the rich man in particular. Um, at least this is how I've heard it. I don't know if it's the same for you, Matt, but like the the rich man didn't go to hell because he's rich, but he goes to hell because he was uh, selfish, maybe, or he didn't invite Lazarus in. He wasn't kind of going out to the margins. Um, he was too proud. He was negligent. So the, the sin is not the wealth itself, per se. The sin is like a handful of um, other sort of moral trappings that go into being a bad rich person, as opposed to a good rich person who presumably would still go to heaven. And in the one sense, that's fair, right? The parable actually doesn't come out and say, well, he was rich and therefore he went to, to hell, right? There's, I think there's more going on. But at the same time, uh, it also doesn't give us this kind of rich inner life <laughs> of, uh, of any of our characters here. And I think it's, it's interesting to at least try to read this parable um, at face value. And then I think as we'll find, like, you know, getting a little bit deeper, it actually kind of intensifies that simplicity more than uh, complicates it. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, evangelicals do love to play up the fact that it might not be because he was rich. It might be because of some other reason, you know, like you said, um, to complicate it and to kind of get around this uh, clear admonition of wealth. <laughs> Though another way I've heard, heard this read in evangelical churches, which I think is really fascinating, is this is like a warning against uh, people who are looking for signs, which I, uh, which is, which is interesting, oh, right? right? Like, uh, uh, the rich man, he's in hell. He says, "We'll send resurrect Lazarus and send him to my family uh, as a ghost or whatever, <laughs> so that they won't, uh, they won't, <laughs> they won't uh, make my same mistakes." And Abraham says, "Nope, sorry, they've got Moses and the prophets." Um, wow, that was a big pull. I don't think I've ever heard. Oh, that really? One. Oh man, yeah. It's like you know, it's uh, it's against. Um, it's like warning against like new agey kind of people who can uh, summon up spirits. Huh. Or whatever. Wow, that's wild. Evangelicalism is full of uh, full of this weird stuff. There's no there's yeah, no end creative. to uh, how far they'll go to miss the point. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for that. Yeah, I think so. Not really. But uh, OK, so um, we're going to get to maybe some of the class stuff in a minute, though. I, I suppose it's kind of throughout. Um, but before we go any further, I think it's worth maybe talking about some of the characters in the story. And then we can kind of talk about the narrative itself and, and figure out like what's all going on here. Um, and mm -hmm. I think at that point, uh, William Herzog is extremely important to kind of parse some of this out for us. Um, I think in previous episodes, maybe we've uh, leaned a little bit too much on Herzog <laughs> and uh, gotten like kind of into the weeds. So in this time, uh, I'm going to try to just tell you who these characters are, and then we'll talk through the parable ourselves. Um, okay, so there are two characters in the story. Well, there are three if you count dogs. And Abraham, I guess four. Okay, fine. But there are two really <laughs> important characters in the story. <laughs> That's the rich man and Lazarus. So let me tell you about these two guys. Um, so the rich man, according to William Herzog, belongs to the urban elite, the class that controls the wealth, power, and privilege. Jesus' brief description makes the man's position clear. He's clothed in purple, the most costly dye, whose use was severely limited among the elites, and then he wears the garments of luxury, which insinuate that he lived like a king. 
The rich man eats as he dresses with extravagant excess, not on one special day, but every day, right? That's in there. So the rich man's not just like a rich guy. He's not, you know, the professional managerial class. He's like <laughs> a very rich guy, a rich, rich guy. So rich that he can eat like uh, a big, he doesn't have to eat Domino's pizza every day. He has to, eat, he can eat like the, the fanciest of pizzas every single day. Um, right, right. So there he is. He's extremely rich is kind of what we're supposed to, we're supposed to get here. Uh, William Herzog later, he goes on to talk about the, uh, the descriptions of his clothes a little bit more. Um, the finest garments, the garments of luxury that, uh, are mentioned in Luke. He says, um, you know, at that moment would have been like cotton and like linens from Egypt. So it's like, um, it's imported goods, right? It's, uh, it's something big, uh, which is all just to kind of reemphasize the point that this guy is extremely rich. So there you go. On the other hand, though, there's Lazarus, um, and William Herzog says this about him. Lazarus is a destitute beggar clothed with ulcerated sores, lying at the great gate. The verb here is often used to describe an afflicted person, bedridden, or crippled. It connotes one who has been thrown down or cast down by fate or other unspecified forces. One of the purposes of the parable is to disclose some of those forces. Lazarus is perpetually hungry in light of his skin condition, and he's probably shunned as unclean. This made begging even more difficult and may account for his passivity. It goes on to say some more things about Lazarus that I think are kind of important too. Uh, Lazarus has been thrown down at the rich man's gate, hoping to receive what fell from the rich man's table. Most commentators assume this refers to the crumbs or table scraps. But as early as the first decade of this century, Claude Montefort, who's a, a scholar who I, I don't know, <laughs> but... This is what he says. Uh, Claude Montefort recognized that it also refers to the loaves of bread used as napkins by the rich and his guests. Um, this is a quote from Montefort. Napkins were not used for the hands. The guests wiped their hands on bits of bread and then threw the pieces under the table. Rabbinic traditions cite reasons for purity and hygiene for adhering to the practice, and they also command the gleaning of leftovers for sharing with the poor. Whether guests broke off one piece of bread from the pita-like loaf before using the remainder as a napkin, or they helped themselves to a stack of bread loaves designated as napkins, makes little difference. In the rich man's house, the purpose of the practice was the same. It was another form of conspicuous consumption that turned necess that turned the necessities of life into disposable. <laughs> what a weird thing, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it is super weird, but I think it's actually a, an, an important historical detail that does make the rich man's wealth even like more emphasized. Mm -hmm. Right? That it's not just like. <laughs> You know, you hear the word crumbs under the tables and you think like, oh, I dropped a little bit of Dorito on the floor and my dog <laughs> can eat that or something. But this is like the, these are people like spilling soup on their shirt and soaking it up with a pita bread <laughs> and then like throwing that on the floor. And it's like, oh, my God, it's the weird right? it's like, like Texas oh, Roadhouse yeah. situation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, OK, so I, I that, that part is it is weird, but it's an important uh, detail that yeah. str it stresses the overall like chasm between uh, Lazarus and the rich man. So um, then Herzog does give us some uh, some other insight about like the the economic context um, that a beggar like Lazarus might come from. And this is like kind of all speculation on Herzog's part, but it's probably not wrong, really. So in past episodes that we've talked about parables, uh, Herzog will talk a lot about kingdom of Israel in like terms of an advanced agrarian society. Right. It's not capitalism, but it's like it's not like a, it's not. It's not not capitalism. Also, I think in a lot of ways, proto capitalist you see in the, some ways. Yeah, yeah, totally proto capitalist. You see the traces of uh, what will become capitalism later. Um, you know, in some very complicated ways. To say to say it's just capitalism would be too simple, but mm -hmm. um, but it shares a lot of similarities. I think, and that's kind of what's important. Um, but anyways, Herzog says that most people like Lazarus would begin their life where the vast majority of the population was born in the country, either on a peasant farm or in a village. A beggar such as Lazarus may have had the misfortune of being second or third among the sons of the family because the family only had enough land to go to the uh, eldest because that's who would inherit it. So it's just like he was uh, he was probably a peasant farmer. He probably didn't get any inheritance because maybe his older siblings did. Um, and then he is also a person afflicted with some kind of like, um, like skin condition, which makes working even harder. Right. How does he get to the city is a great question. And Herzog says that like, well, probably, um, you know, a rich man, just like the one in the story, um, you know, how would they get rich, uh, lending to farmers and then foreclosing on their land. Right. So like these exploitative means Lazarus is a beggar, not just because of his like skin condition or something. 
Uh, but it's because specifically the rich man kind of like put him there, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I think that's an important part of the story. And, and um, that's what Herzog does really well in this book and kind of explains how that might have worked out. But like uh, Lazarus is is uh, is a beggar because he doesn't have uh, a house or his land has been foreclosed upon or something, right? So he's forced to the urban center rather than living in the countryside as being like a, a day laborer or whatever. So um, all these things are really connected. But I think these things kind of taken together they make the meaning of the parable a little bit more obvious. Um, you know, the people who would have listened to this story would have heard these, uh, heard about these characters. And first of all, this particular type of like genre of story, like these inversion stories are like uh, pretty like normative stories that have been told, you know, all, but before the gospels, right. Jesus wasn't the first person to tell this kind of story. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's in the rabbinic literature. It's in, uh, you know, different kinds of like uh, cultural takes on this as well. But I, I think that, what we hear in this story though is like a pretty like straightforward explanation of two people um, who could not be further apart uh, in terms of class. And then their positions get switched in, in the, uh, the afterlife when they die. Right. And and that's quite interesting. One other point I want to note here really quick too um, in, in Luke 22, I'm sorry, in Luke 16, 22, um, when it says the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side, um, Herzog says that this is maybe like a euphemism that means that like he just died on the street and nobody mm. buried him mm-hmm. um, whereas the rich man also died and was buried so like that difference is also kind of like denoting this chasm between the two in terms of like social class and economic class so I, I don't know it's just like everywhere you look throughout this entire parable what you're seeing is like Jesus explaining the drastic and like unjust class differences between these two. So I don't know <laughs> when evangelicals go out of their way to, to misread this or to like misunderstand it or to make it not about wealth in some way. It's like deeply frustrating because all of these signposts point to it being about that in particular. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's also revealing of what it means to hear a parable like this without any class consciousness in general. And also when you're formed by kind of capitalist mythology, because you know, the the myth of capitalism, to make it work, you have to assume that somewhere along the line in a capitalist society, two people, as we like to say on this podcast, they meet in a field and they have absolutely no <laughs> background, right? They have no history, no real um, kind of extenuating factors, just two rational adults hanging out and they make it they make voluntary choices with each other and then they they go away you know they do a free exchange that's the the capitalist myth that out there somewhere is this kind of free non coercive uh method of exchange and that's all capitalism is and if you have that kind of myth in your brain it's easy to then see a story like this and say well it must be a tale about moralism right there's one person who is not very good and uh, is not nice, is bad, and that's why he goes to hell. There's another person who didn't do anything wrong. You know, he was down on his luck. He was a, he must have been a basically good person, and he goes to heaven as a result of it. And if you don't have those kind of class uh, antennae up, I guess, if you don't know anything about either the first century, like me, and you have to have someone explain it to you, (laughs) or you uh, just don't have the reflex maybe to see the class difference in the text, um, you're inevitably just going to, you know, interpret it in such a way that, I guess, reproduces the economic conditions of your time. And I think that is a really helpful uh, moment as well to sort of understand how if we're really into like a good biblical hermeneutic or something, it can help us undo the the capitalist myths in our brain as well, because they're not, that's not the economic logic operating uh, in Jesus's time in a, in a big way. Yeah, that's right. Um, it is true. The class interest thing is, is a big part of it. Um, if you're, if you've not, if you've never struggled with money a day in your life, you're going to read this in a way that, uh, it, you know, you couldn't possibly be the bad guy. <laughs> but even if you, even if you do struggle with money, you know, like, I guess I'm thinking about this in terms of let's say you're in an evangelical or like charismatic kind of Bible study or something and everybody is either middle class or lower middle class or poor or whatever. Um, Like I'm just thinking about I've been in Bible studies like that in the past and I could see everybody kind of probably coming to basically the same conclusion, which is that this is, you know, ultimately a story about how, yeah, some for some rich people like. They're not nice or their wealth. They probably even admit that like wealth can blind you to the situations around you or something like that. 
um, and maybe even have some sympathy for the poor as an abstract, you know, character or whatever. Um, but uh, capitalism is so entrenched, especially in evangelical ways of reading. I mean, evangelicalism, I think, is like the true Marxist reflection of capitalism in a, a kind of uncut way. Um, in that case, it's just no matter where you are in the social scale, that's how the ideology reproduces itself in a really yucky kind of mechanism. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Well, um, Herzog kind of concludes his section about this particular parable by explaining that this is, I mean, just like you said, <laughs> kind of kind of informed by uh, class and wealth, and uh, we should really read it in, in that way. So Herzog finishes out this whole thing saying, the parable is not a story about abstract social type, but a story about representatives of two social classes, the urban elite and the desperate expendables, those who had nearly everything and those who had nearly nothing. In this case, wealth may indeed lead to Hades, for such wealth could be obtained only by the systemic exploitation of the poor, and it could be maintained only by their continual oppression. The urban elites who lived at the expense of the poor twisted the Torah and the temple to serve their ends. They read the prophets for their comfort and Moses to study the purities, lest they should become unclean. Their wealth is their wealth and its use in conspicuous consumption, their rapacious greed and its extraction of any surplus from the poor, their pursuit of power and privilege with its accompanying suppression of the people of the land. All these characteristics of the rich man's class reveal that wealth is no sign of blessing, but a curse on the land. Um, so there's a few important things to pull out here for sure. One important thing that might kind of like fly under the radar, especially if Christians kind of reading it today, is that there is like this assumption, I think, in the gospel that Jesus has to kind of push back against a few different times that like um, if you're sick or if you're um, suffering some kind of like malady or whatever, um, it's because of like some kind of sin that you've committed. Right. And this is telling you something different. Right. Uh, Lazarus, he goes to heaven regardless of like the uh, his, his afflictions. Um, and, uh, and it's also a pretty hard push against the prosperity gospel too, right? That like, uh, God will give you things if you're like a good person or if you like, if you worship God in just the right way and ask for the right things, then God will give you a bunch of wealth. Your paycheck to Joel Osteen. Oh yeah, exactly. (laughs) So I think there's all that going on, which is, which is quite interesting. Um, but also the other interesting part is that, um, that this can't like the, the evangelical reading that, um, well, you know, the rich man, he goes to hell. Um, but it's really not his wealth that put him there. This kind of lays that to rest, right? Because it's not that like um, he's just too proud or he's too conceited or he's too arrogant um, because, uh, you know, evidenced by the way he treats Lazarus after he dies even, right? Even when the rich man is in hell, um, he's not even asking Lazarus to do something. He's asking Abraham to ask Lazarus. Like it's a, it's a big like uh, may I speak to your manager kind of moment for sure <laughs> yeah. in hell, uh, from hell to heaven. So, you know, it's it's it, it can't even just be like about that the rich man's just a bad person or something. And he should have spent more time with the poor on earth. Right. It's specifically that the rich man is in hell because he can't see Lazarus as like a real person mm-hmm. because of his wealth, mm-hmm. because of his systemic exploitation. Right. So it's like it's not it's not just that uh, his wealth put him in hell, but it's that his wealth created something um, within this man that he can't like see he can't get past the chasm that exists between Hades and, and Abraham, right? He can't get past that because of his wealth. So it's like, this is not like, uh, this isn't just that he's a bad guy and he's in hell. It's like wealth made him a bad guy Mm -hmm. and he's in hell. (laughs) It's both of those things. Right. And I think too, that piece about his inability to see Lazarus on his own terms is really important because like you said, it's the uh, can I speak to your manager moment. Um, it, it, the fact that he asks Abraham to also then order Lazarus around is really interesting, yeah. right? Because uh, it's like, well, these are the kind of people who get ordered around Abraham. He's a, a, a noble guy or whatever. And it's even in the afterlife, this uh, the rich man can't seem to understand that like Abraham and Lazarus are walking around as equals, right? Uh, he's brought to Abraham's side. They're just hanging out. And uh, Abraham has to kind of like put him in his place and be like, sorry, you had your shot. You didn't take it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, okay. before we move on, though, there is one more part. Maybe this will take the wind out of our sails or something a little bit. Um, We keep saying this is like heaven and hell, but I think it's actually important that uh, these are anachronistic ideas that we're kind of putting onto the text. Because, uh, I mean, throughout the throughout the gospel reading, it doesn't say hell. It says Hades, which is a specific idea. Mm-hmm. with all kinds of uh, cultural trappings around it. 
And also, like, Lazarus being with Abraham is not heaven. It's right. something different <laughs> than that. You know, it's not the Christian way of thinking about heaven or something like that, right? It's it's different. And I think, like, in my experience as an evangelical, I think that there is a very weird tendency to think about this in terms of, like, like, like how, how does the afterlife work? How, how yeah. does the afterlife work? Like, this is, like, some kind of, like, revealing moment that tells you that, like, when you're in hell, you can see people in heaven. When you're in heaven, you can see people in hell. And isn't that so strange? But like, I think that's that's such a weird thing to think mm-hmm. because these cultural ideas are are different than that. Um, and also, it's just like this is a cautionary tale. Like this is what Jesus <laughs> is telling. It's a parable. He's not actually giving you some kind of revelatory like uh, explanation of how heaven and hell work. Yeah. But like, uh, of course, that's where at least my my evangelical brain. For sure, went a whole bunch of times about this particular text. Yeah, um, yeah. Doing the uh, the afterlife calculus about how all this works <laughs> is uh, is a lot of time wasted. I think on my part. Yeah, somewhere in someone's Sunday school notes, there is like a cartography of the afterlife that's just being cobbled <laughs> together from uh, these kinds of passages. Um, and I would like to see it. I gotta say, uh, <laughs> yeah. So there is all kinds of interesting stuff in this parable, but I think. Uh, one thing that my mind goes to right away, obviously, is the kind of parallel to our own time. How do we plot this uh, when it comes to the rich and the poor in our own day? And we'll get some of those bridges uh, built or crossed or whatever with the Gospel and Solent Denominate. But before we do, uh, it made me think of a really interesting point that Marx makes in the first volume of Capital. Uh, and uh, I thought we could sort of pause before we transition to just talk that piece through. So... In Capital, uh, there's a section where Marx is talking about, like, how working people are abused by capital, basically, as kind of a force. Like, Capital, Capital C, is a a thing out there prowling around, roaring like a lion, trying to steal you away. Um, So Marx says, uh, To the outcry as to the physical and mental degradation, the premature death, the torture of overwork, Capital answers, Ought these to trouble us since they increase our profits? Oh, wow. What a callous people. Uh, He then says, but looking at things as a whole, all of this does not indeed depend on the good or ill will of the individual capitalist. Free competition brings out the inherent laws of capitalist production in the shape of external coercive laws having power over every individual capitalist. And this is a passage that's often cited when people talk about like the kind of challenge of class war in Marxism, because people will be like, well, I I have a good boss or I know somebody who is a boss who is good and I've had both good and bad bosses. So I get the impulse for sure. Uh, But what Marx is trying to say is it doesn't really matter if you have a good boss um, or if a capitalist is a good person or a bad person, the ways that capitalism operates sort of compel us into weird behaviors or they, you know, they make us do things that, uh, we might otherwise not do if it was kind of just a, an abstract moral choice or the way he begins this little passage. When people are upset about workers being uh, abused or premature death or tortured by overwork and so on, uh, the voice of capital as a kind of abstract force is like, why should we be bothered with that? That actually increases our, our profits one way or the other, right? So I think that kind of just, I don't know, came to mind as I was thinking about this parable, because I think Jesus is talking about something kind of similar here, that the rich man is caught up in the the spirit of capital or the spirit of wealth, at least uh, that kind of unjust accumulation, which is always done at the expense of the poor. You know, uh, the rich man is rich because he probably foreclosed on the land of somebody like Lazarus at some point. And is that because he was necessarily being a bad person? Not necessarily. That's just the way that if you want to increase your your power and wealth in the ancient world, that's just how you do it. Um, So I think about that today, you know, like uh, capitalists, they could be good or bad. Nevertheless, the system is such that it compels us to uh, engage in these kind of acts of violence um, against the poor. And also it kind of insulates us, too, from the the real effects uh, on those people. Yeah, I love that. Um, all truth is God's truth. We know that. And uh, <laughs> Jesus and Karl Marx are agreeing right right on uh, the money here with one another. Um, I think this is such a good thing to bring up. And here's here's an extremely, <laughs> maybe this is uh, a tangent in a different direction, but I think it is a helpful uh, example of this happening, like in real life capital. <laughs> so um, I work for a union. Everyone knows this. We all love it. It's great. Uh, and, um, 
I've been really invested in this particular piece of legislation in California to get it passed because uh, it's been my job to, and also it's good legislation. So what can I say? Uh, <laughs> basically, there's this piece of legislation called AB 257, the Fast Recovery Act in California. And what it does is um, it would, if it was passed, and it has been passed, so that's great news, um, it it creates a an industry-wide council for fast food workers so that they can set – uh, important industry-wide standards on things like um, pay and uh, safety in the workplace and different types of like, you know, different patterns of like sexual harassment and other types of discrimination, all kinds of great stuff. Um, anyways, it is extremely good. It's like, you know, um, when Rosa Luxemburg talks about non-reformist reforms, like this is it, right? It's it's leveraging a whole lot of power in the state apparatus and giving it to like the lowest paid workers in the state. It's good stuff. I love it, and I'm really excited that it passed. Anyways, when I was watching the uh, debate for it in the California Senate, you heard a lot of this kind of thing, right? There would be, like, um, <laughs> there'd be some Californian senator that would stand up at the microphone and say, like, well, listen, this is going to really hurt uh, the franchise owners of McDonald's. Um, I know a friend, uh, and he's a franchise owner. He owns a subway. He's a really good guy, and I don't think he exploits his workers. And all of these things that these workers are saying, well, I don't know. It's not true. And it's so frustrating because it's like because you know a guy <laughs> or because they're your friend, it doesn't mean they're not explo <laughs> exploiting workers. And it's like, you know, it's assuming that the the evil done in the name of capitalism is like, done because capitalists are meaning to do it like that they are intending to hurt people and that's probably not exactly true right they do it because that's the way capitalism works because like you know capitalism doesn't work without the exploitation of workers you, you just can't do it um but it's like it's not like anyone's getting up out of bed and like trying to figure out how to make someone's life worse it's just like they're trying to figure out how to make their life better in the scheme of capitalism so they do that and they inadvertently or maybe less so sometimes make workers lives worse but I, I think it's a good observation because uh, people do this all the time with all kinds of things, you know, maybe not not just like McDonald's franchises, but like, uh, you know, there's a CEO who is really um, he's going out of his way to give some of his money to a charity or or whatever. It, it doesn't matter. Right. As long as you're still kind of like uh, upholding the structures that force people into uh, really hellish situations like you're a dirtbag and that's all there is to it. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, too, is that like. Well, we've talked about this on the show also a bunch, but Paulo Freire in Pedagogy of the Oppressed has this really great line about how the liberation of the oppressed is also the liberation of the oppressor because the oppressing class is so, um, well, he would he would say dehumanized by their uh, process of, of oppression that they can't even see their liberation as, uh, as liberation, right? It feels like they're being oppressed, uh, which in a certain sense, like they're losing maybe some power and influence or some wealth and so on because they would have to in order to rebalance those kinds of scales. But they're gaining their ability to live in, in a healthy relationship with others. And I think that is such a powerful point as well, right? That like uh, this parable also points us in that direction. Uh, the rich man has really lost his ability to see Lazarus as another human being. And uh, Lazarus's dignity is restored in Abraham's by Abraham's side. Uh, but uh, the rich man continues to kind of be stuck in this violent vision. He, he, he couldn't get liberated from it, even though he had Moses and the prophets and everything else uh, just uh, wasn't able to be liberated. And I think that is a, a huge sort of tragedy as well. Right. We don't have to necessarily kind of revel in the suffering of the rich person, but we can see it as like, what a bummer. This guy uh, enjoyed all the comforts in in life, uh, but ended still in this really like, um, I don't know, like uh, limited view of human beings at the end. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a way to read this as like a being about class hatred, which I think would probably be wrong um, because it's it's not necessarily. Um, there's also a sense in which like these, uh, you know, like the cultural ideas around like the afterlife and this story you know it's not necessarily final either right like I, I don't know like how would the how would the story have played out differently <laughs> if the if the rich man like uh apologized to Lazarus or something right like maybe it would have been different once again I don't want to get too way down about the uh 
the cartography of the uh, <laughs> of the afterlife here that we're getting in this parable, particularly. So I'm going to stop myself before I say anything more. Um, Dean, uh, not only does this uh, story show up in Herzog, but it also shows up in the Gospel and Soul Taname. So do you want to tell us about that part? Yeah, for sure. Although, let me take another quick detour. Since we're on the Marxism kick and you just brought up uh, class hatred, I was just thinking this also comes up, this passage in uh, Karl Kautsky's book, Foundations of Christianity. Um, so Kautsky was a uh, kind of like the next generation of Marxism in some ways. Uh, complicated guy, complicated history. Uh, he was friends with Friedrich Engels and uh, was a, a committed Marxist for a long time. And anyway, he got confused during the World Wars. And what can you say? Anyway. He wrote a weird book about Christianity, <laughs> and in it he says this. Um, he says, Class hatred against the rich appears clearly in the Gospel according to Luke, a composition of the beginning of the 2nd century, especially in the story of Lazarus, um, which is found only in this Gospel. The rich man goes to hell, the poor man to Abraham's bosom, and not because the rich man was a sinner and the poor man just. Nothing is said about that. The rich man is damned just because he was rich. Uh, the thirst of the oppressed for vengeance is gloating here. The same gospel has Jesus say, how hardly shall they have the, shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God, uh, for it is easier for a camel to go through the, the needle's eye, and so on. Uh, here, too, the rich man is damned for his wealth, not for his sinfulness. So I agree with you, Matt, for sure. There's an open-endedness to this parable in a wider setting. We could kind of imagine like some kind of redemption for the rich man. And when we talk about the gospel in Solentaname, I think there's some good clues about that, too. Uh, but I think it's also really fascinating that Marxism identifies a moment of class hatred here. And there's something of a moment in, in Christianity. But maybe that's the, I don't know how to put it, maybe that's the difference between a revolutionary Christianity and a kind of pure form of, of materialism that like in Christianity, you could kind of imagine the parable ending differently. But uh, for the Marxists, there's only the, the kind of class hatred minute or something like that. But let's go to Salentaname. So the gospel in Salentaname, if you've never heard of it, welcome to this podcast. You'll hear about it a hundred more times. Um, it is a commentary on the Bible, a sort of record of conversations had in a, a community called Salentaname in rural Nicaragua, led by Ernesto Cardinal, the patron saint of this podcast. And uh, they talk about this passage, and they have a few great pages, but I just pulled out a couple passages of insight that I thought were really fascinating. So I'll pull them out, we can pause and chat about them. So one character in the discourse, uh, Felipe, says, What I think is that neither the rich nor the poor ought to suffer the fate of those two guys in the gospel. The rich man damned for having squandered selfishly and the poor man screwed all his life, even though afterwards he saved, which means there shouldn't be rich or poor. Nobody should be screwed in life. Nobody should be damned in the next life. All people ought to share the riches in this life and share the glory in the next one. I love that. Really communizing the material goods and uh, communizing the spiritual destiny. Uh, Felipe's out here trying to put it all together. And I think that's the the kind of resolution, right, to the uh, the open-endedness. Could we imagine a world where uh, nobody ends up having a bad time? Uh, what, a, what a good comment from Felipe. Yeah, I think that's really good, actually. You know, there's um, th there's an impulse within, like, I think more radical tr traditions that would be like, you know, pie in the sky when you die. That's a lie, as Utah Phillips would tell you, right? <laughs> and, um, but but I think, like, reading the story that way reading the parable that way is a little bit um wrong because you know it's not like uh, be because parables as we've learned from william herzog are not like stories that jesus like says and then they're sort of like done with the conversation like those are the those are the ways conversations would start with jesus right he would tell you a weird story and then everyone around would like talk about like what it means right and I think what's so cool about Felipe, though, is that, like, I think this is a good example of, like, what you could say after the story. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's not like this story uh, it has, like, a, a moral to it. It has sort of, like, a moral logic to it. That's all very interesting. And you can hear it and you can understand what Jesus is saying. And then then Felipe from the crowd can say this and Jesus would be like, oh, yeah, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that is a, such a, a valuable contribution from Herzog, too, right? Just to... Remember that these are conversational prompts, not like conversation stoppers, which is what evangelicals usually treat them as. Um, and not only them, most Christians, I guess, treat them as uh, the open and shut case where Jesus is proclaiming, you know, the end of it. Um, but they're meant to be sort of uh, prompts in community. Um, 
All right, here's another observation from Ernesto Cardinal. He says, uh, the poor man is badly off because the rich man is well off. Or the rich man is well off because the poor man is badly off. There are poor people because there are rich people, and rich people because there are poor people, and rich people's parties are at the cost of the poor people. Uh, a point we've already made, but worth kind of reiterating here, right? That uh, the class inversion that we get is also kind of speaking to the, maybe like the the sort of bounded nature of these two characters too. They only really exist mm-hmm. because <laughs> they're in this weird economic relationship. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's good because, you know, there's a certain way of looking at the story. Like if you were a capitalist, you'd be, you would be hard pressed uh, to maybe see how these two characters are related. You know, like, um, okay, so like they they both die, but like, why is why is the rich man talking to Lazarus in particular? I don't know. Like, they have nothing to do with each other, right? Like, Lazarus is just some poor guy outside his gates, and like that sucks for him. Maybe he should have got a job, but like, I don't know. It, it seems uh, pretty clear though that these are two characters that are intertwined in a in an intimate way, not because they know each other, but because they're related economically, right? And you know, still the true, still true today, maybe even more so that the. Uh... There are rich people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bozos and all the rest of them because there are, you know, millions and millions of people in poverty. Um, all right. Cardinal also goes on to say, it seems to me that Jesus's principal message is that the rich aren't going to be convinced even with the Bible, not even with a dead man coming to life and not even with Jesus's resurrection. And then the crowd says, so what can we do? And then a character, Alejandro, says, uh, joking, force them to believe. (laughs) Which uh, I guess they did do in Nicaragua. They had a whole revolution and everything. Um, But I think it's a great sort of problem, right? What do you do when this is a parable told in such a way that maybe it could prompt uh, the rich? It's a a cautionary tale, a warning tale. Um, But what do you do when the rich also don't listen to to Moses or the prophets or to Jesus? Uh, And I like Alejandro's coming out here being like, yeah, well, we just have to create the conditions where they have to believe it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, like Alejandro, unjoking, force them to believe. But like, you know, what that means is like, do something that makes them have to listen to you, right? right. Like, I don't know, like the like the the fast food workers, they pass legislation that now <laughs> is going to be a thorn in the side of every like big fast food company in the entire world. Um, and what what is that? It's forcing them to believe. It's exactly that. I mean, what's what's a revolution but forcing the rich people to believe that uh, the rich are that uh, that the rich aren't convinced by the Bible, but they'll have to be convinced by something Mm -hmm. else. Um, There it is. Yeah, exactly. Um, All right. One last sort of bit from the Gospel in Salentaname. So starting with a character named William, he says, Abraham has told the rich man who is being damned that there is an abyss between him and the other man. There is an impasse, total separation, and it's the rich man who has placed that abyss of separation between the two of them. Reading a little bit into the text, but nevertheless, <laughs> um, sure. Cardinal says uh, there are now advanced sectors among Christians who don't believe much in hell. It seems to me a very revolutionary dogma that there is a place of damnation and that the rich are in it. <laughs> pretty, pretty classic Cardinal line, but uh, anyway, yeah. something to put on the table here. Yeah, for sure. Um, I. I can empathize with the Christians who don't believe in hell much. I feel like a lot of times I don't believe in hell much, but uh, this is, this one sounds good to me. <laughs> this is a good one. It's a chasm. There's a chasm between the uh, between people in hell. The rich people are on one side. Everyone else is on the other side. And uh, the rich people are the ones that are kind of keeping it in place. I think that sounds about right to me. Yeah, you know, maybe this is the time to, to sort of uh, put on our speculative cartographer's hat and think about uh, <laughs> how does the chasm even get there? Right. So in the end, Abraham just says that there's a chasm that has been placed. Right. He doesn't really say, like, who put it there or why it's there. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, there's so many fun ways to read it. Like maybe the, the chasm is there because you have to you have to protect the Lazaruses from from the rich people trying to uh, mm-hmm. order them around or something. Right. Uh, I like William sort of coming up with this uh, interpretation where. The rich man is the person who put the abyss there in the first place, which makes sense, right? He can't even recognize Lazarus as a a human being in community. So it's a kind of symbol of that division, maybe. Um, And kind of reading that in with what Cardinal says, that there's a place of damnation and the rich are in it. I think if we read those things back to back, there's actually a really interesting kind of um, suggestion there that uh, there's a place of damnation and the rich are in it. But it's the rich are, are there because like, they've made it so right they've made it such 
Um, mm-hmm. That is, I think, a really unique uh, take um, and one one that's like <laughs> operational, maybe um, in a way that other versions of hell just kind of are more about. I don't know, retribution and enjoying people's suffering or, you know, coming up with the weird kind yeah. of affect of like watching people from hell and heaven, all those kinds of weird questions. You know, when I was, this is a dumb story to tell. I've probably told it before and I've probably told dumber stories, but anyways, I'll do it. Uh, when I was 19, I took a philosophy religion class at my evangelical Christian college and I read, uh, I, I read St. Anselm and uh, got got into the ontological argument for God. Uh, you know, um, God's like the greatest thing. And if God is the greatest thing, then God must exist because existing is better than not existing. Right. Some good stuff there. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, reading that's probably not exactly the ontological <laughs> argument, but I'm not going to stop now. In reading that, that like really spun me out in this very weird direction, because if God is like this really good thing, then how can God send people to hell? Like and that, like that deeply messed me up. And I remember going home during like Christmas break and telling my mom that I didn't believe in hell anymore. <laughs> and that was like the that was like the initial rift. <laughs> I think not necessarily that there's a rift in our relationship, but that's like the initial rift between um me and like that particular type of Christianity. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, you know, whatever, universalism seemed like a really good idea to me because I just couldn't like imagine like, you know, if I have to believe in God, which I guess I do, I don't know, uh, grasped by that idea. Uh, then I can't believe in a God that sends people to hell. But now I've come. Now I'm. Now that I'm 34, I've come full circle, and I believe in hell <laughs> again, and uh, it's great, and I love it. <laughs> you know, the, there's a really weird. Uh, all right. So speaking of books we read at 19, I probably read this book at maybe 17 or 18. I was still in high school, but uh, C.S. Lewis has this book, uh, The Great Divorce. I couldn't tell you if it's actually good or bad because I was too young to remember. I, I or yeah, it happened too long ago. They read this book. Um, But the one thing that did stick with me is uh, C.S. Lewis, extremely weird guy, do not endorse. But uh, he has this uh, this kind of picture of hell in that book that I think is actually maybe still worth thinking about, where the idea is like hell is basically a place where everybody's grumbling with each other. And kind of the premise of the book is if you go there, if you're in hell, you can like you can make a new house wherever you want. And uh, first, it sounds great. But it's always like kind of annoying, like it's always sort of raining or, you know, just like a thorn in your side. And the idea is initially, like when whoever this character is who goes to hell, like initially there's this big sort of empty, like streets and streets of empty houses in the middle of hell. And he learns later that it's because people just kept building new houses further and further away from each other because they like couldn't stand being next to each other. And the sort of plot, I guess, is that... Uh, people are in hell because they just like would rather be there than live in community together in a healthy way, which is what heaven is. And I think there's something to that, (laughs) that maybe if you kind of put a class spin on it is, is pretty interesting, right? That like hell is the place where people go because they actually do not want to live in an egalitarian way. Um, It's why maybe like, I think it's hard for me to believe in an eternal hell these days, but I really like purgatory a lot. <laughs> I, I really like the idea that like everybody's got to get something burned off before you finally make it into that big communist uh, kingdom in the sky. And, uh, you know, some of us have maybe a little more to burn off than others, but uh, we've all got to go through it. So I think that's where I've landed metaphysically. Purgatory is great. Hell, I, who could say? But uh, we've all got to sort of burn that off. <laughs> sure. Whatever you say, Dean. Um, that's fine. But for me, I believe in hell specifically. Right, right. Of course. <laughs> and rich people, they're there until they're not there anymore. And it's great. <laughs> right. It sounds like purgatory, but that's fine. You're you're Anglican, so. I'm, I, I'm too Protestant to believe in that kind of thing. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, there's a what? There's a big hill I have to walk up to get to heaven. All right, whatever. You say. <laughs> it's more, think That's of it fine. more like a big dentist's waiting room. <laughs> All right, it's a big dentist's waiting room, and some people are are on the very far end. Though is what it sounds. Yeah, like. for sure. They the the highlights magazines. All the crosswords have been done, and they're from like thirty years ago. So, not gonna enjoy those. <laughs> Now I'm just picturing, though, the rich man yelling across the waiting room for Lazarus, and uh, that's a great image. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's going to have to wait a long time for that hygienist to get around. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, okay, Dean, we've come so far. Um, we've come so far. We've read a parable. We've talked a lot about hell. We got into my uh, extremely weird past <laughs> and fraught, fraught theological uh, confusions. 
Um, and that's great. What do we what do we come to at the end? How, what do we do with this information? Whoa, what a great question. I have absolutely no idea. I guess uh, off the cuff, I would say what we do is we recognize that there is a I think uh, there is there's a recognition of class antagonism in the Bible that Jesus is trying to pull that out. And I think it matters that we see that as part of the faith because there is such a drive to build class harmony into Christianity because love should overcome everything and so on and so forth. Um, But the fact that there is such a stark division and that this parable is trying to tell a story of somebody who is kind of, you know, (laughs) creating a hell on earth and then is upset when they go to hell after uh, that is an important kind of thing. You know, I've been reading this book, The Imperial Mode of Living, lately. Maybe we'll talk about it later in this podcast, but... Uh, it's really driving home for me exactly how much I'm complicit in building a literal hell on earth for other people in the global south, especially. I mean, here too, but especially in the global south. And uh, I think we need to rediscover that part of Christianity, the part that's trying to get us to see other people as people, uh, trying to get us to not order the poor around to make us shitty minion backpacks or whatever else we're buying here in the global north um and uh yeah the bible's pointing us in that direction that's what i'm gonna say uh you put me on the spot matt so i'm gonna put you on the spot and say what do you th- what do you think <laughs> oh, no. we should do with this parable well i mean i think what you said is good i so i agree with you is guess what I'm, is what I'm gonna say that's where i'm gonna center on no i mean i think more than that though i really like to think of this as like a conversation piece right like i i love to imagine that piece of it that jesus is telling the story so much people and the people are kind of like pushing back on him and like saying something else like trying to complicate the story or trying to get one over on him or just trying to like turn the tables on jesus in the conversation i love that idea i think that's great um and i really like kind of what felipe says that like um we have to recognize these two characters as connected right economically connected in the end kind of like spiritually connected in this weird way um but what if we could what if these bo- both these guys didn't have to be screwed right what if one guy <laughs> didn't have to live like this on earth and one guy didn't have to li- live like this in hell i think that's like a great aspiration um and, and maybe like a great moral vision and a, and a way to recast the story in a way that like gives us something more from it because like the the reversal story is interesting and it feels good and like um it, it feels good when when something bad happens to somebody you don't like as i keep saying on this podcast uh, over the, like, the past few weeks um but like i feel like it it uh it does wander dangerously close to class hatred in in the way that kotsky says and i don't like that part of it <laughs> i like the idea that like maybe we could just kind of like uh we can take this as a cautionary tale and uh, we could imagine a world where neither person has, like, you know, the rich man doesn't have to go to hell because uh, they won't be rich. And the poor person doesn't have to, like, live a crappy life on Earth because he's not going to be poor. I think that's uh, a, a great direction to head for me, to, to recast the story in a, in a more revolutionary light. Well, you agreed with me. I agree with you. What a great way to end a podcast. Um, the, the first podcast after summer camp 2022. Um I don't know where I'm going with this. I feel like I'm I'm entering into like how we close off the walk in mode, and I I've got to get out. I've got to backpedal. This is well. You see, when when you come back from evangelical summer camp, you usually are very alienated from your friends <laughs> right. because you're so on fire for Christ. Right. But this time, it's it's not like that. So that's great. You know that it's uh it's really good work. I guess. Yeah, it is great work. Um, so maybe just like we do end the walk in, I'm just gonna say uh love one another have a great time have a great (laughs) summer don't ever change um and uh we'll we'll see you next week thanks for listening to the magnificast if you like what you heard you can support us on patreon at patreon.com slash the magnificast um you can uh if you do do that which would be it'd be nice if you did if you don't it's fine too no big deal but you can get a cool invite to our exclusive discord uh our discord channel where we talk about mostly the queen today because she did just die. Uh, but also all kinds of other things like pets and recipes and, uh, usually a lot of, uh, environmental dread. So if you need, if you need a place to get that, if you need to load up on that kind of stuff, come on over to our discord. Um, our intro music is by Amari Armstrong. Our outro music is by the illogical spoon. And we'll see you next week. Get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church. We'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation. Never get tired, never bored. Don't worry, someday there'll be no dam between us and our Lord.
Jackson, you keep your hoods up, you keep your hoods up, and you stay up late. In Jackson, you keep your hoods up, where you keep your hoods up, and you stay up late. Oh, don't mind a cold night, but we might mind if you leave too soon. So come on now, it's still early, at least I would have.